Hello everyone, and welcome back to our next lecture over control of microbial growth in our asynchronous microbiology lecture series. Um, this lecture is going to cover how we stop microorganisms from growing in places that we don't want them to grow, and how we keep them from growing there in the first place. Um, so let's go ahead and get started with that. Um, so since the beginning of time, people have had to deal with two major issues when it comes to keeping bacteria and microbes out of places and things. Um, and those are people and living organisms. Um, we don't want us to get sick um, or our pets or farm animals and things like that to get sick. So keeping us and um, other living organisms free of microbes and getting the microbes out of us once they get on or in us, um, as well as in our food. Um, so that microbes that cause food spoilage, so keeping foods uh, safe for a really long time, um, became a really big deal um, for microbiologists to solve. Um, so a lot of uh, focus was put on preserving foods um, and keeping uh, uh, humans safe um, when it comes to interacting with um, you know, microbes in the world. Um, and that process, um, for a really long time, the best they could kind of do was you know, add salts and sugars and things like that. I mean, we still do a lot of that today. Um, but as technology progressed and, and more things were discovered, there are lots more ways um, to keep bacteria and microbes out of things and off of things. Um, and that's what we're going to talk about here. So there are lots of different ways um, to keep microbes from growing on or in things. Um, but they can easily be broken down into three different categories. Um, you have physical agents, um, mechanical agents, and chemical agents. So a physical agent is, um, is like getting hit by a car. Um, you're going to die if you get hit by a car. You might be uh, immortal, you might live forever, um, but if you get hit by a car, it, it's going to kill you. Um, whereas something like a chemical agent, um, you might be immune to that particular uh, disinfectant or that particular um, uh, chemical, whatever that happens to be. Um, so that's not always going to be effective depending on the organism that you're using. Physical agents almost always kill things. Um, it's like getting hit with a car once again. Um, whereas chemical agents, uh, you might be immune to said drug, um, or you might have to use more different ways, different methods of it, and things like that. Um, and then you have mechanical, which is um, just removing them physically from something. So you go in and you physically remove them. Physical agents kill them. Chemical agents kill them. Um, and then you have the mechanical methods, which are just physical removing of microbes, like scraping them off the surface or something like that. Um, so let's go ahead and talk about that. Um, the first thing to really get into before we talk about how to remove bacteria and microorganisms from a surface or, or, or a place um, is the different levels of resistance when it comes to different microbes. Different microbes um, are harder to kill than others and this makes sense if you think about it. Um, we've talked about capsules, we've talked about um, cyst and protists and things like that. Um, and those types of, of things make organisms harder to kill um, than others. So uh, prions, um, they're in our viral lecture, um, misfolded proteins, there's really nothing to target on a protein. They're very difficult to destroy. Um, endospores, if you recall about endospores, they're pretty much indestructible, very difficult to destroy. So if you have a, an organism that you know produces endospores, and you're trying to clean it off of a table, it's going to take a lot more work than to, you know, remove something like E. coli that doesn't produce endospores, because you have to uh, take into account that endospores are harder to remove and harder to kill um, than something just like simple like E. coli. And you have pseudomonads, which are resistant to a lot of drugs and a lot of um, um, dis, uh, disinfection processes and things like that. Mycobacterium doesn't dry out. Staphylococcus, protozoa cysts, they can survive in the presence of lots of chemicals and things like that. Um, and then you have the normal guys down at the bottom that are pretty easy to kill with most, you know, like boiling and Lysol and things will take them out for the most part. Um, the medium and higher resistant organisms, um, they need a little extra something or other to kill them. You have to, you have to be special attention, you have to pay special attention um, when you suspect or you know you're using an organism that is one of these or produces one of these things. Um, so it takes a little bit of extra to kill these guys. Um, so endospores that protective, uh, strong coat, um, resistant to pretty much anything, but really, really, really strong chemicals, um, which will pretty much you know melt your skin off kind of thing if it's gonna destroy an endospore, or really, really, really high heat and pressure, um, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, protozoan cyst, um, lots of chemicals won't destroy these guys, um, but boiling and cooking them will. 
Um, so that's that's kind of a, a good thing. That's why we boil water and stuff like that. Um, but chemicals, if you chemically treat water, um, the cyst will not die. So boiling and chemical treatment is advised if you are suspecting that you have protozoan cyst in your water and things like that. Mycobacterium, um, that waxy coating that they produce that makes them acid fast. Uh, chemicals pour off of it and, and things like that. Um, wax and water don't mix, and wax and uh, wet chemicals don't mix, um, so they're resistant to many things. Uh, Pseudomonas species can actually grow in disinfectants, which is uh, a common problem in hospitals. Um, they recommend you change the disinfectant, uh, uh, get new ones, um, as well as change the brand and type. Um, so you're not using the same disinfectant over and over again. So you're, you're supposed to make a new solution and get a new bottle every once in a while, um, as well as get a new type and a new brand um, to keep this from happening. Um, and then we have enveloped viruses and non-enveloped viruses. Um, enveloped viruses, the cell membrane around them are uh, essentially what that is. Their envelope is very easy to destroy, um, so they're a lot easier to target versus something like a non-enveloped virus, um, which doesn't have that, so they're a, a lot harder to, uh, to target uh, with something. Um, so I've mentioned this a little bit already, but measuring death in, in organisms, especially microbes, is, is a lot harder um, than it is something in, in like, a, like a human or a cat or a fish or something like that, um, where dead is dead, living is, is living. Uh, and you can kind of just tell by looking at the organism if it's moving around and brain activity and things like that. Um, but in microorganisms, um, it's a little different because it, it's really hard to tell if they're alive in the first place. Um, they don't. Some of them don't move. They don't really do much. Um, so in microbes, the definition for microbial death is uh, defined as the loss of reproductive ability, um, even under optimal growth conditions. So this means you put it in on, on a per petri dish that it that has everything it needs nutrient wise. Um, it has the optimum temperature. Everything that it wants for it is there. Um, now, the organism may be able um, to eat the nutrients, it may be able to carry out metabolism, but it cannot divide. No binary fission will take place, and it is unable to regain the ability to divide. Um, so that means that it is permanently lost reproductive ability. That organism is now considered microbial dead um, in the microbial sense. It's dead, microbiologically dead. Um, so that definition of death is different. Um, than the definition of death that we use for humans and things like that. Um, and there are lots of different things that can impact how quickly organisms die um, in the microbiological sense. First off, the number of microbes present. And this makes sense if you think about it. If you have one and you pour a little bit of chemical on it, um, it's pretty much going to get that one uh, guaranteed. But if you have a thousand of them, it's going to take a little while for the chemical to get to all of them. Um, or you know, the chemical might be diluted by the time it gets to them and things like that. So the number of them, um, the longer it's going to take, the more of them and things like that. Um, the temperature or the pH, different chemical agents, different physical agents and things work better um, at different temperatures to kill, different pHs to kill and things like that. Um, the concentration of the agent. Um, and this makes sense if you think about it. Things like hydrogen peroxide. You've got your hydrogen peroxide you get home is three percent. It comes up higher, you know, twelve percent, fifteen percent. You can get higher than that. Um, so the more of the chemi the agent in question, um, the stronger it's going to be when it comes to killing microbes. Um, but hydrogen peroxide at a certain point will melt your skin off as well. So there's a catch twenty two on that. Um, how it works. Different microbes have a, a different susceptibilities to different things. Um, an, a, a, an agent may destroy cell membranes. Well, if you're a non-enveloped virus, it doesn't matter. You don't have those. So um, it doesn't really particularly impact them. And then a big one, um, when it comes to cleaning things, um, cleaning surfaces and things, especially in hospitals and, and at your house, um, is the presence of dirt and other organic debris and matters and things um, on the surface as well. Um, so if you have a, a chemicals agent that you're using to destroy bacteria um, and microbes that breaks down cell membranes or breaks down fats or something like that, um, and you're trying to clean up uh, a fecal spill or something in a hospital where somebody got feces on a table, um, if you don't wipe the thing first and clean the feces off first, um, and then you just go straight to the Lysol, just clean the feces up with the Lysol, you expect to uh, sterilize it and everything as well. Um, the Lysol and bleach or whatever you happen to use is going to spend most of the time destroying the cell membranes and lipids and fats and things inside the feces. Um, it's going to destroy the dirt. So it's going to destroy the biological matter um, that's in the most uh, numerous amount, which happens to be you know, feces or oils or whatever it is, instead of destroying the microbe. 
Um, so if you read things, bottles like bottles of bleach or things like that, it says clean the surface first and then use bleach. Um, so you're removing all of those nasty things first, so then the bleach can, or Lysol, whatever it is, can spend its time cleaning and destroying the bacteria, um, other microbes, instead of destroying just the uh, feces or oils or dirt or whatever happened to have been on the table. Um, so if you have uh, lots of extra stuff in the system or uh, that you're trying to clean, it's best to clean that first with something else um, and then go sterilize or clean afterwards um, to clean up the microorganisms. So lots of different things can impact how quickly um, microbes die, um, and that's just a few of them. There, there are probably quite a few more. Um, you can see here different methods, different times, uh, different heats and things. Um, will impact different uh, rates of death and things like that. Um, and, and we'll talk about this a little more in depth when we get there. So these are the ways um, that are used, uh, physical means, um, uh, to control bacteria. And you've probably heard a lot of these terms before, sterilization, disinfection, things like that. Um, but they all have different meanings when it comes to microbiology than what we're, we're used to. Um, sterilization in the sense of microbiology is destroying all living organisms. If something is sterile, if this pin were sterile, there would be no living organisms on it whatsoever. And that includes things that aren't necessarily living, like um, viruses or prions. Um, and it also is going to include endospores, non-metabolically active but still living organisms. Um, so all of those things will be destroyed. There will be nothing on this pin whatsoever other than dead bodies or broken down pieces of a virus um, or, or prion, whatever it happens to be. Um, so this pin, as long as it stays in a sterile environment, this is what happens when you get your dental tools at the dentist's office and they pull them out of that little blue packet. Um, as long as that blue packet are, uh, is not opened, the environment is not broken, nothing will be introduced. The organisms that were there to start with are dead. Um, so that organism and that, or that, that environment will stay sterile. Um, and then you have disinfection. And disinfection is a process that's used to destroy pathogens um, on a surface, not a living organism, um, a surface. So you disinfect a table. Um, so disinfectants are also used on a table. Um, or on a surface or something. So when you disinfect something, there's going to be organisms and bacteria on it. Um, and when you use a disinfectant, you're not trying to destroy everything there. This is the concept of, um, I have a castle, and I'm uh, somebody's trying to take, take my castle, and I only have 50 archers. Um, and there's a thousand people trying to take my castle. I'm going to die. Um, disinfection works like this. There's a thousand bacteria on the table. That's a lot of them. If I put my hand down there and get it on my hand and touch my face, I'm going to get sick. That's too many organisms for my immune system to handle. When you disinfect a surface, it would be essentially like taking that thousand people that are coming to take my castle and turning it into more like seven. Um, so disinfection removes the vast majority of pathogenic microbes down to a point um, where their number no longer poses a threat. Um, your immune system can handle it. There's not enough of them to get inside of you or anything like that. So my 50 archers could pick off seven people, uh, no problem whatsoever. So it doesn't pose a threat anymore. Now the problem is those organisms can grow back. Um, living organisms are still there. Um, after a certain time period, they will grow back and repopulate that particular area. Um, so you have to re-disinfect it again. Um, you can use an antiseptic, and an antiseptic is a disinfectant that's used on uh, living organisms. It's, that's poured directly on the body's surface. It would be like hydrogen peroxide or something like this. It's the same concept. It destroys the vast majority of the pathogenic organisms. It doesn't destroy endospores, um, but it, it knocks the number down um, where the immune system and the nat body's natural defenses can handle it um, instead of being overwhelmed by so many organisms at once. Um, and you can sanitize something, um, which is just mechanically removing organisms from a, a surface or, or, or a thing. Um, and then you can have degermination, um, which is just removing the numbers through a mechanical means. So lots of different terms that kind of get applied in the same way, um, and they're used for different things. So just uh, antiseptic, disinfection, same concept. Um, one's used for living organisms, one use, is used for uh, inanimate objects and things like that. So we'll talk a little bit more about these in detail. So, um, sterilizing something. 
So like I mentioned, when you sterilize something, you are removing every living organism, including prions that are not living, viruses that are not living, and endospores. Um, nothing whatsoever is going to be found on the surface of this thing other than dead bodies and broken little bits and pieces of stuff. Um, when something is sterilized, the organisms on it will not re-come back to life, um, and it's going to stay sterile until the, the environment is breached and you know, something is reintroduced. Um, a very common way to do this is using an autoclave, you can see here, um, doctor's offices, medical offices, vet's office, we have one on campus that's huge. Um, you put it in there, it, it's essentially a giant pressure cooker. It makes a lot of steam, a lot of heat, a lot of pressure, um, and the combination of the heat is going to kill a lot of organisms. And then when you add in the pressure, um, that's going to force the heat um, inside the organisms. Heat makes the cell membranes and cell walls kind of open up a little bit. Um, and then the heat, uh, the pressure forces inside the steam, the water molecules, the high pressure, uh, high heat, high energy water molecules. Um, and then essentially the little microbes cook to death from the inside out. They boil from the inside. Um, this also kills endospores. And this will kill viruses, um, prions, pretty much anything that is of concern in the microbiological world an autoclave will destroy. Um, and that's why it's the best thing to possibly use um, to sterilize things. If you want something sterile, this is the best thing to do to get it. Um, tattoo guns, piercing needles, things like that, um, dental tools, things that go inside of people for surgery um, are going to be sterilized. Um, now, there is a slight problem with sterilization. Um, there are certain organisms that can survive this process, but it's very, very, very rare. Um, they can come, they, they will be destroyed for a small short amount of time, temporarily um, set back if you like, and then they will kind of reactivate themselves after this process. So if you ever work with one of those, you will know it at the time, they will make you well aware that this organism is a potential threat, um, but they do exist. Um, there are giant autoclaves out there that are used to make industrial tires, so the big giant tires um, on you know, bulldozers and things like that, uh, giant dump trucks are made in giant autoclaves. Um, giant pressure cookers, which is kind of interesting. Um, the main problem with, with uh, using an autoclave is it takes heat and it takes pressure. And it also takes steam. So it limits what you can put into it. You can only put metal, you can only put glass, you can put certain types of plastics inside of it. Um, but if you want to sterilize something that's, uh, you know, um, paper, it's going to get wet. If you want to sterilize something that's uh, a peck of petri dish, it's going to melt. So certain things you can't put into an autoclave. And this is how we get around um, this process uh, of sterilizing things that you can't sterilize in an autoclave. It's called tindalization. Um, John Tyndall, the same guy that uh, did the endospores, invented this kind of process. Um, it's the same kind of thing. You introduce free-flowing steam um, over uh, the... the uh, thing. So they don't actually come in contact with um, the heat or the actual water itself. It, it's, 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 a, it's just a flowing heat kind of thing. It's very interesting how this works. Um, but this is used on can, uh, sensitive meats, uh, sens or, sorry, sensitive medias in a microbiology lab, um, plastics and things that we can't necessarily stick inside of an autoclave. Um, so disinfection, as I mentioned, um, is the process of just removing the pathogenic organisms down to a point where they no longer pose a threat um, to you or I or anyone else. Um, there are still living organisms present in that uh, you know, ecosystem or that environment, um, and they will grow back. So disinfection is a temporary surface, uh, a temporary means um, of controlling the number of microorganisms which are found in the area. Um, a disinfectant is a solution that's used to kill or, or destroy or inhibit the growth um, of microorganisms on a surface. And disinfectants come in two different versions. You have germal cytic and germ static. So germ cytic and germ static. Um, you've probably heard this term before, homicidal, things like that, germicidal, um, bactericidal, fungicidal, um, fungicide. It, it killing something is what that term means. So um, germicide is just the generic term for it kills microorganisms. So you can have something that kills bacteria that's a bactericide, a fungus, fungicide, things like that. Um, in in a, back, a disinfectant that's considered a, a germicidic 
or germicidal, or bactericidal, whatever, um, is going to directly kill that organism outright when it comes in contact with it. Now, if a substance is able to physically destroy um, a living cell, that's going to be a very strong type of disinfectant. It's probably going to break down um, your tissues. Um, so disinfectants and things um, are, are really highly regulated when it comes to classifying them as antiseptics. Um, and then you have germ static. And germ static is going to just slow down the growth um, or maybe prevent them from being able to reproduce for a little while um, or something like that. So they're not going to kill them. Um, it's just going to kind of knock them back for a little while, set them back a little bit. So they can continue to grow. It doesn't kill them. Um, it'll stop their growth for a little while, and then um, they will be able to resume their growth after uh, that chemical is, uh, you know, um, removed from the environment or it's, it's, it's uh, lasted how, however long its half-life is or something like that, and it's worn away. Um, and then those organisms will be able to grow again. So two different means of action, um, and different bacteria will be, and different microorganisms uh, will be impacted differently by different things. Um, so one particular disinfectant might be uh, cidal to one organism, and then another organism it's static. Um, same thing with, with drugs, if you recall how um, gram negatives and gram positives and things don't work um, the same antibiotics. So same kind of concept here. Certain things um, will be killed by certain uh, disinfectants and then others won't. Um, so the big deal between a disinfectant and an antiseptic um, is a, a disinfectant um, doesn't necessarily have to be safe enough to, on, to use on your skin. Um, it's going to be used on a table. Um, that's why they say don't touch it. If you get it on your skin, wash it off and something like that. Whereas an antiseptic um, has to be safe enough to not destroy living tissues. If you're going to pour something on your arm to clean a wound to get bacteria off or microbes off, um, you don't want it to burn your arm off at the same time. Um, I'm glad it killed the organisms, but it also killed you in the meantime. Um, so that's a big deal here, and that's the difference between a, a, a true disinfection um, and an antiseptic. Disinfection is used on, living, uh, on, on non-living surfaces, um, whereas an antiseptic and antisepsis um, is used on living surfaces, living tissues. Um, decontamination is the same concept used on living uh, organisms, just removing the numbers of pathogens down to a safe level. Um, pasteurization, you guys have probably heard of this one before as well. Um, this is removing microbes that are of particular concern when it comes to food and food spoilage. Um, so the microbes that live on us, um, if, if they get in things like milk, um, they don't necessarily always cause a problem. There are environmental organisms that live in milk that don't eat milk, no big deal. Um, but E. coli and things like that, which regularly live in or on warm-blooded animals, um, can eat lactose. So they will spoil milk sugars and things like that. So um, what we're going to do with a thing called, with pasteurization, it's a very brief process um, where we're going to heat this um, milk, this entire container up to a certain temperature and hold it there um, for a little while. And what that's going to do is it's going to kill organisms that we know cause problems in humans, um, and cause problems with food spoilage. Now, the organisms that just live in the environment, um, that can survive different heat treatments and things like that, they're not going to be killed. We don't care about them. It doesn't matter if they're there or not. They're not going to cause the milk to spoil. Um, now, if you ever get a, a thing of milk off the shelf um, and you leave it out for a couple of days, it will eventually spoil. And that's because there are living organisms on there, but it's going to take a lot longer um, than if you were to get unpasteurized milk from the store and set that out, and it'll pass, it will spoil very quickly because E. coli um, and other organisms are present in that milk, which will spoil it very quickly as compared to the environmental microbes, which take a lot longer. And that's what we're killing off are the ones that cause food spoilage. Um, we're also trying to kill off organisms like tuberculosis that regularly lives in cattle and things like that um, because they, call, they pose threats to people that consume that milk. Um, tuberculosis killed thousands of people um, prior to the, the advent or the, the widespread use of pasteurized milk. Um, they would simply drink it, um, the bacteria would be spread from the milk into the human, um, and then babies or adults alike would get sick with tuberculosis and die. And now that we pasteurize milk, um, organisms like tuberculosis are killed off in the pasteurization process and they don't really pose a threat to much as anymore. Um, most food that if you've, uh, you eat that's packaged or um, pre-packaged or meant to be shelf-stable for a little while um, is almost always going to be um, pasteurized. 
Now, it doesn't eliminate all the microbial life. Remember, I mentioned that milk will spoil eventually, even if you don't open it. Um, but it does kill off the ones that are dangerous for us and the ones that will more cause that um, milk and food, whatever the food substance is to uh, spoil quicker. So preserving food is probably one of the most common ways that people have used since the beginning of time um, to keep bacteria and other microorganisms from growing on things. And preserving it um, can come in lots of different flavors and different ways and methods and things like that. And you're probably familiar with quite a few of these. Um, you can just dry something out that's probably been used forever. Um, beef jerky, um, you know, you just dry something out, the moisture's gone. Um, the organisms that would land there, they need moisture to be able to live. Water is required. There's not a lot of water there. The organisms land on something like beef jerky. Um, there's no moisture. They can't grow. Um, we add acids to things. If you're familiar with pickles, it's the exact same concept of that. Um, bacteria don't like to grow in acid, so it keeps them from growing. Um, so the pickles stay preserved for a, a, quite a long time. We can um, put something in the refrigerator and cool it down, keep things from growing. Lots of different ways we can add chemicals, things like nitrates, that are added to food substances to keep bacteria and other microbes from growing um, in the presence of that what otherwise would be a, a very good nutrient source for them, things like soda. Um, soda is nothing but sugar, um, but it's also full of tons of acids um, that inhibit bacteria from growing for quite a while. Um, so when it comes to killing organisms and microbes in the environment, um, the, whatever you're going to do with that particular instrument or whatever the, the thing you're going to use, um, however that, whatever the purpose of that thing is, will determine how clean um, or what type of method you need to use to clean or sterilize or, or whatever it is, whatever you're using. Um, that'll make a little more sense here in just a second. And this is really going to apply more to patient care and dealing with um, um, sick people in hospital settings and things like that. So. Um, when it comes to dealing with um, your bacteria and microbes like that, you have to ask yourself these questions. Um, does it need to be sterile? Is it going inside someone? Is it going to break the skin barrier and go into the sterile parts of the body? Um, if the question is it's going to be sterile, uh, if it's going to break the, the skin, yes, it needs to be sterile. Is it going to touch the outside of the skin where there's bacteria anyway, things like that? Is it going to be reused? Um, different, is, is whatever I'm going to use going to be able to penetrate the substance? So um, if you've got a concrete, you know, you pour water on it, it'll seep in a little bit. But if you use something that's water repellent, you try to use a disinfectant like that, it's not going to work. Um, is it, is it uh, you know, cost effective? Is it worth doing? Um, so there are lots of different questions you have to ask yourself before you decide how to appropriately clean something. Um, in most places, in most hospitals and things like this, have procedures and protocols in place, labs and things to, you know, to get you started on the right way. So when you get there, they will have these protocols set up for you. Um, but in a hospital, um, the three big things that you're dealing with um, when it comes to cleaning and killing microbes and things like that are the stuff that you put inside people and stuff that goes on the outside and stuff that they touch. Um, you can break those up into three different categories, critical, semi-critical, and non-critical instruments or surfaces. Um, so a critical instrument is something that's going to come in direct contact with the inside of a patient. Um, so things like surgery tools, scalpel blades, um, something that's going to go inside a broken piece of skin, um, something that's going to break the, uh, if you recall the donut concept, it's going to go inside of our donut, um, the nice fluffy inside of the donut. Um, the, where there's no bacteria to start with. We don't want to introduce bacteria where there are no bacteria to begin with um, because then they'll just have a nice free place to grow and there's really not anything there to help kill them off uh, to start with. So it, that's very dangerous. Um, so critical instruments are things that are going to be coming in contact with broken parts of the skin, broken parts of the body, and going directly inside. Um, they have to be f clean of everything. Um, and then you have something called a semi-critical instrument. And semi-critical instruments are things that are going to come in contact with the body via mucous membranes. So things like endoscopes, um, colonoscopy equipment, and things like that that are going inside the body, um, but not inside of a broken tissue. 
Um, now, when you're talking about something like Clostridium difficile, C. diff, um, the endospores in this particular organism are a big deal. So if you suspect that or if you know that's a, a thing, you have to take extra precautions to clean um, that particular one. Um, but environmental endospores and things like that really don't pose much of a risk to people um, when it comes to that. So that uh, that particular one, C. diff, is a huge process with endospores. So um, colonoscopy endospore equipment has to be taken uh, extra precaution to clean that. Um, but things like you know, um, the ear thing that goes in your ears and things like that. That's why they just switch the little cover and not the whole thing. Um, the little nose things that they put in your nose and stuff like that. Um, just as long as you clean it well, you, you switch the outside. You don't really have to worry about endospores coming in contact with you and causing problems in your nose um, in that sense. And then you have something called um, non-critical instruments or surfaces. And a non-critical instrument would be something like a blood pressure cuff. A surface would be this, the... the um, bench that you sit on or the, the doctor's chair or something like that. Um, and it's best to just clean those down. You want to wipe them down, make sure that they're not covered in anything nasty um, and things like that. But you don't have to sterilize a chair. Um, it's going to be coming in contact with non-broken skin or clothes, um, something like that. So there's really not much of a threat um, from anything that might happen to be on it um, to the person um, or patient that you're examining. So different types of instruments, different purposes for different cleaning, different cleaning for different uh, uh, things that they're going to be intended for. So um, something to take note of. Heat has been used forever to destroy microbes. Um, heat works by, if you've ever cooked an egg, it's the exact same concept. You know that the egg starts out as a runny white uh, yolk with the little yolk in the middle. Um, and then as you cook it, the, the whites turn into a, a a nice fluffy um, pillowy cloud and that's what's happening called denaturing you're denaturing and breaking down those proteins they become coagulated um, inside of the, the uh, egg white and stuff like that and they stick together and the same thing happens inside of a microorganism when you expose it to heat their proteins denature the cell membranes break down you can even burn the cell membranes burn the cells destroy them that way if it's enough heat um, and things like that. So um, simply cooking with heat has been used for thousands of years just unknowingly. People didn't know that bacteria existed. They just knew that when they cooked something it made it safe to eat. Um, they didn't know how. Um, but nowadays we understand that when you use heat there's two different types of heat. Um, and an autoclave takes advantage of this. There's something called dry heat and wet heat. Um, and if you've ever held your hand over an oven um, or the stove top and a stove top with boiling water on it you know exactly what I'm talking about. You can hold your hand over a stove that doesn't have anything on it for a little while, and it's still it's warm, but it's not going to hurt you quite as much. But if you hold your hand over steam, um, that's going to hurt a lot. And wet steam is significantly better at killing wet heat, um, is significantly better at killing microorganisms than dry heat. And the reason for that is is uh, the, the steam sticks on you. It, it carries more energy. So the heat wave passes over you. The steam sticks on you. The water vapor sticks to you. Um, and it makes you get hotter, so that's not a good thing. Um, especially if you're a tiny little microorganism and you can cook with a couple of those little water molecules on you. Um, if you add in pressure, you get the concept of a, um, uh, an autoclave where it forces the water molecules inside of the cells and that's going to just cook them from the inside out and that's even worse. Um, so dry heat works by cooking the surface proteins um, it takes a little while longer. You have to physically destroy and cook the cells. So that's going to take a little while longer. Um, whereas something is wet heat, it just has to get on them. It carries a lot more energy. It's hotter if you like. Um, it kills the organisms a lot quicker than something like dry heat. Um, so different, different ways and different methods. Um, sometimes you might not be able to expose something to an autoclave. Um, sometimes you don't have time. So microbiology loops and things are often sterilized using dry heat. Um, just an open burns and burner um, or an incinerator or something like that. Um, when it comes to dealing with heat, you have two different uh, temperatures um, that come into contact here, or two different uh, um, factors, the thermal death time and the thermal death point. Um, and the thermal death time is how long it takes to kill um, all the particular organisms in a sample. Um, so if you know that E. coli... Um, it takes five minutes at the minimum to kill all the E. coli at 30 degrees. Um, if you're cooking at 30 degrees, it'll take five minutes to kill them. 
And that's a useful information. If we know that, we can extrapolate out. Anything hotter um, should kill them quicker. Anything cooler should uh, take longer. Um, so knowing the thermal death time for an organism um, is a really important thing. Um, it's been uh, established for quite a few microorganisms, if, uh, so you can look them up if you need them. Um, you can also find the thermal death point, um, which is the lowest temperature that it takes to kill them. Um, in that particular sample. And that also matters. And, and both of these things come into play because you might need um, uh, to find a particular method of killing lots of bacteria very quickly um, and you don't have an autoclave, so you can only get uh, you know, boiling or something like that. So what temperature can you get to and how long does it take? Um, or maybe you have something that if you put it in a high temperature, it's going to be broken down. Um, so you can put it at a lower temperature for longer. Um, so you can manipulate both of these factors, if you know them, to work out ways to either treat things for longer at a cooler temperature or treat things for a shorter time at a higher temperature. Um, and you can work these things out knowing both of these things for different microbes. So these are very important um, when it comes to dealing with how to um, sterilize and how to control um, different surfaces and microbes and things like that. Um, and these are established for most microbes. So if you ever need these, you can find them um, or they will be provided to you um, at the place that you're working at. Um, so pasteurization comes in two different forms as well, um, but they all work on the same process. Um, so pasteurization was developed in the 18, late 1800s um, by Louis Pasteur. And if you know anything about how wines made, they age it in wooden barrels. Um, they ship it in sh uh, um, holes of ships um, in those wooden barrels. It's dark, it's hot. Um, and that's everything that mold likes. They grow in the wood naturally. So once they poured the bottles, um, poured it out of the wine jugs into bottles um, in the late 1800s, the wine bottles weren't clean, the wine bottles weren't sterile either. So everything was fighting against them. The, the wine that was coming out of France at that time um, was moldy, it was nasty, um, it was skunky, so it would get really gross. It, they were having a lot of hard time uh, selling it. Um, outside of France. They could drink it quickly in France, but the second that they bottled it and tried to ship it out of France, um, it would spoil on the trips. Um, so they, they turned to Louis Pasteur, pretty much the whole country, for somebody to try to fix this. Um, and Louis Pasteur was the guy that figured this out. And what he did was he took his bottle of wine, he corked it, and he heated it up to a, a, a lower temperature than what it would take to destroy the wine. So the flavor of the wine is still kept intact. Um, but just enough heat and just long enough to kill um, the microorganisms that spoil the wine. So the mold's gone, a couple of the other bacteria and things are, are destroyed in this process. So you can take the bottle and you can ship it from place to place and you don't have to worry about um, microorganisms destroying um, that bottle of wine in transit because they're dead, um, which is a nice thing. Now there's two different forms of pasteurization. There's high temperature, short time and ultra high temperature. And you use these different methods depending on what you're trying to sterilize. Um, so things that are going to be like milk, big giant uh, gallons and things like that, um, they're going to be high temperature short time. You know, you, you, you adjust the temperature, you adjust the time for each different type of product, but overall it's about 72 degrees Celsius for about 15 seconds. So you heat this whole bottle, gallon of milk up to 72 degrees and you keep it there for 15 seconds. And that's just long enough to destroy the E. coli and the other organisms that are uh, um, causing problems inside of that gallon of milk. Um, you cool it back down, and then it'll sit at shelf stable um, as long as it's refrigerated and it won't spoil for a couple of weeks. Um, and, and that's a, a good thing. That's a wonderful thing. You, you know, preserving uh, milk for longer than a couple of days um, allows you to ship it um, and store it, and then you don't have to you know go buy a bottle of milk every couple of days either. So that's a good thing. Um, and then you have ultra high temperature, and there's two different methods, the batch and flash method, and this is not a huge deal. Um, but the ultra high temperature is going to be used for things um, that are going to be served in single storage containers. Um, you need this, the container to be sterile as well. Um, you don't want uh, this thing that's going to be, it's going to be stored for a quite a while. Single serve containers are meant to be stored and used for a, a long time. Um, where something like a gallon of milk that's uh, this type of sterilization um, is usually meant to be used very quickly after it's produced. So um, you need the, in, the container to be sterile inside of the juice box and our little uh, half and half containers down here. Um, 
So you use a significantly higher temperature um, to kill the microbes and things like that that would be on um, the package as well as what's inside of the liquid itself. So it's a little higher temperature um, that's used to do this. So different temperatures, different methods for different types of product and what they're meant to be for. Short-term use, long-term storage, kind of how that's for. So killing bacteria with cold um, is also a really big uh, deal. Um, you use this at home in your refrigerator. Um, we use this in the microbiology lab. Hospitals use this a lot um, to preserve augers and media and things like that. Um, you also use this, like I mentioned at home, to just keep your food um, from going bad quickly. So cooling bacteria down, they're going to spend more time trying to keep themselves alive um, and not freezing to death um, than they are going to be worried about dividing. Um, so cooling them down, putting them at a certain temperature, either it might outright kill them um, or it'll prevent them from being able to grow and divide. Um, so cooling down food, different uh, medias and things like that, petri dishes are stored in the refrigerator before we're ready to use them. Um, and even bacterial cultures are stored um, in the refrigerator so they don't eat their petri dishes so fast so we don't have to um, constantly replenish their, their petri dishes and constantly remake them. Um, desiccation is another way that's used to preserve uh, food, um, you will find microbes that are lyophilized, desiccated is the term for that. Um, and this is just removing moisture from the cells um, of the organisms themselves slowly over time, drying them out. Um, so you suck the moisture out of something and it's going to go to sleep, it's going to die, um, and things like that. Um, so bacteria are often lyophilized, which is the term for this. Um, and shipped that way. Now, if we ship them that way, we lyophilize them, that means they can come back to life. So if we suck the moisture out of them, essentially it's not going to kill them. They just stop being able to uh, carry out metabolism. They just go dormant, essentially. So the second that water is reintroduced to a lyophilized organism or desiccated organism, they're going to come back to life. Um, so drying something out is not the best way to preserve something. Um, if you add moisture to beef jerky, the bacteria that are on it are, are, will be reintroduced or whatever um, will instantaneously start to eat it. So as long as it's dry, um, it, it'll last for quite a while. But as long as, is, until the moisture is reintroduced, um, but once the moisture is reintroduced, it's going to have problems again. You can filter um, organisms out of something. This is a mechanical method. Um, physically just removing them from the environment. You use a filter um, that's too small for the bacteria to pass through and you sample, uh, you, you uh, suction uh, the moisture or whatever you're trying to filter out through it um, and then the organisms will be retained on that filter. Um, so whatever comes out is completely sterile. You sterilized, um, completely removed them using a, a, a mechanical method. Um, instead of an autoclave. So this is a really cool way to sterilize liquids and things that might break down in the presence of an autoclave. Um, some sugars will um, destroy themselves, break down in the in, in presence of heats and things like that. So these types of augers and medias, you have to sterilize like this. Um, you filter them sterile. Um, you also can sterilize, get a quick filter. Um, if you don't want to wait for the autoclave to run for a couple of hours, you can. Uh, if you just need a little bit of a TS broth or uh, something like that, um, you can sterilize it and filter it out real quick like that. So um, very useful, lots of different ways um, that this is put into practice. Um, filtered water from the water filtration plant um, is filtered, obviously, um, from the water treatment plant. They have giant filters that are, are hundreds of gallons at a time um, that rush through them. The thing's huge, um, and that's how they get bacteria and things out of wastewater um, and sewage water and things like that. You can use radiation to kill bacteria. Um, radiation is super cool. Um, radiation, when it uh, radioactive, the energy, the, the radio waves hit the um, um, organism cells, it causes water to break apart, it causes damage to the DNA. Um, and when the water uh, molecules break apart, they produce things called superoxides and free radicals. And both of these things are going to destroy the cells. Um, they will, you know, um, shred cell membranes, shred DNA. Essentially, they stick to one another. Um, a free radical on this side of the cell and a free radical on that side of the cell are going to stick to one another. Um, and they don't care what's in the middle. It'll break DNA, cell membranes, anything in the middle. Um, so being exposed to radiation, radioactive, things like that will tear apart your DNA, which might kill you outright. Um, or those free radicals um, will shred your cells apart and cause damage to you and kill you that way. Um, 
And radiation is used to treat a lot of plastics, things that can't go in the autoclave, um, that'll get destroyed um, in the heat presence of the heat. Um, so petri dishes are irradiated, lots of plastic cups, plastic forks and things are irradiated. Meats and apples and things like that are irradiated to kill the bacteria on them. We can't send them through an autoclave, it'll cook them. Um, stuff like that. So what happens is once these things are irradiated, the radiation, once it touches them, it's going to kill the organisms on the surface. Um, it doesn't penetrate down particularly well some of these types of radiation. Um, so um, ionizing radiation penetrates quite well. Um, it's going to break apart DNA. Um, it's going to sterilize a lot of our food products and things like that. Um, it's going to penetrate deep down and kill most of the things on there. Um, whereas um, something like non-ionizing uh, non non -ionizing radiation excuse me, um, is not going to penetrate particularly well. Um, so radiation that's ionizing is used to sterilize things like uh, foods, apples, and things like that. You can see here um, five days after exposure to radiation, these raspberries are still nice and um, not fuzzy as compared to ones that are not treated, just regular um, off-the-shelf raspberries, and that's why they go bad so quick. Um, steaks, apples, and things like this. Now, this type of radiation, once it hits the raspberry, once the radiation has been removed, once it goes through, the, it's like a, a runs through an x-ray machine, once the x-rays or radiation, whatever it is, is gone, um, these raspberries will not be radioactive anymore. Um, they're not radioactive at all. Um, they, they, they're not, they don't pose a threat to you. They don't become radioactive. Um, they're not, it just kills the things on the surface. Um, so non-ionizing radiation, since it doesn't penetrate anything, is used in water filtration plants. Um, it's also used in your air filter and things like that. So it just filter, or it'll kill things um, that are just on the surface of the water. So you have a little shallow thing of water um, or bacteria organisms that are going through your um, um, water filtration or your, your air filter in your house and something like that. Um, and if you've used the little UV light things, the click serializers, the little small ones on your phones or something like that, um, that's the same type of, of radiation. Um, it's a, a very non-ionizing, very non-penetrating form. Um, even something like plastic will stop that from penetrating, so you can block it with plastic. Um, so two different types of radiation used for two different types of things, um, but they both kill organisms in the same way. Um, preservation. There's lots of different ways to preserve food. Um, preservation with food has been done with salt. Um, you add salt, it sucks out moisture. That lots of bacteria can't pr um, survive in the presence of salt, as we talked about. Um, so that's a great way to, to preserve bacteria. Sugar, um, lots of sugar, too much sugar, the bacteria can't preserve, uh, survive in that. It's going to cause their cells to dehydrate and desiccate. Um, sugar also, if you know anything about it, you melt it. It makes a nice hard coating. It keeps bacteria out. So sugar cured hams and something like that. Um, you can smoke it, the same thing. You can smoke meats, dehydrates them, um, adds arsenic, very small amounts of arsenic to the surface, um, which is toxic to, to bacteria and things like that from the um, burning of the uh, wood. Um, keeps them um, uh, um, from being uh, able to grow as well. Um, very interesting little process between those. Um, acids are used a lot. Sorbic benzoic acids are used in all kinds of stuff. Um, vinegar is another form of acids that are used. Um, to add to food products, to lower the pH, to keep the organisms from uh, regularly being able to grow um, in those specific places where they normally would. Um, meats um, are commonly added things with nitrates, which is an, uh, um, a commonly found salt. Um, it makes meats look more pink. Um, it also keeps bacteria from growing. Now, nitrates are naturally produced by pretty much every plant on the uh, that exists, and pretty much everything makes them. Um, we get them from celery and other plants. We uh, harvest them from there, and then we add celery juice and things to uh, hot dogs and stuff um, to lower the pH to cause the bacteria to not grow so much in the meat. Um, but what it also does is it makes them look a little more pink, um, which people tend to associate with fresh meat. So nitrates, they cause a slight bit of cancer um, if you eat too many of them, um, but they also help keep our meat safe. So a little catch-22 on that one. Temperature, um, chemical preservation, lots of different ways to preserve things. Salts, sugar, um, you know, tons of different things, sucking the water out, all different kinds of ways. You can freeze-dry stuff, which is a super cool way to preserve things. Um, this is essentially the concept of lowering the temperature while sucking the moisture out at the exact same time. Um, it, it doesn't necessarily 
stop the bacteria or, or kill the bacteria, um, but it, it stops them from growing. You suck the moisture out, um, and that's all that really matters. You suck the moisture out, you suck the water out, um, lower the temperature at the same time, and the bacteria won't grow it while that's freeze-dried, but they're still there. Um, so a lot of freeze-dried foods are pasteurized at the same time just to kind of you know take that extra little bit off to, to kill them as well. Um, so that's the physical and the mechanical methods, um, killing them with heat, killing them with disinfectants and things like that. Um, and then we got the chemical means, so using some sort of chemical to kill these guys. So chemicals. Um, chemicals work best on, or sorry, some chemicals work best on hard surfaces, some work best on soft surfaces. Some penetrate down into things, some sit on the surface. Um, some need you to uh, use a paper towel and add friction, some just kill outright. Um, it depends on the actual disinfectant or chemical that you're using. Um, read the back of the disinfectant bottle. It will tell you how to properly use it. Um, they know what is best for their product. They've done the research. Read it and follow the directions on the product. And sometimes they have different directions for cleaning, for sterilizing, for disinfecting. They have different directions and it tells you different procedures to use for different ones. Um, so check those out when you get a new disinfectant. Now chemical controls come in three different levels. High, intermediate, and low. High level disinfectants kill endospores. We can't get a hold of these. High level disinfectants are going to be things that are found in hospitals and things like that, research labs. Um, they'll melt your skin off. Most of the time you have to have licenses to buy these type of disinfectants. <clears throat> um, intermediate level disinfectants are things like Lysol. Um, you can buy them at the store. It's going to kill most everything of concern to people that's going to make you sick. Um, and that's how that works. It's going to kill you know, pretty much everything that's a, that's a problem. Um, endospores in reality don't be, uh, out in the, the environment really don't cause much of a problem to people, um, so especially under kitchen table. So there's really not much of a need to have a, a, something that's going to kill them on your kitchen table. Um, and then you have low level disinfectants or low level chemical means. And a low level disinfectant is something our chemical mean chemical agent is something like a bleach solution, 10% bleach. Um, 10% bleach solution, um, bleach denatures in the presence of water very quickly. Um, so 10% uh, bleach solution is only effective for about an hour or so, um, and then it will break down. It will still smell like bleach, but it won't work. It doesn't destroy organisms anymore. It doesn't kill them. Um, so low-level disinfectants may or may not work, and they're kind of unreliable. Um, so, you know, that's 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 kind of a, a catch-22 with low levels. So if you want to use a bleach solution or you make your own bleach solution like that, um, you really need to do some research on how bleach works or, or things like that, how the chemical that you're wanting to use works, um, or maybe pick something else um, instead of a low-level disinfectant. So these are the different things, different types of chemicals that are used to kill bacteria, to kill different microorganisms out there. Halogens. Chlorine gases, um, iodine, um, they work in different ways. They denature the bonds um, they'll inter uh, that hold proteins together or the bonds that hold um, DNA together, things like that. But these guys, halogens, they work by breaking apart proteins, bonds that uh, hold your disulfide bonds that hold your proteins together. Um, they're intermediate levels, uh, chlorine bleach, like I mentioned. Um, in the presence of water and things like that, it's going to become unstable. It doesn't last very long. Um, it can break down in the presence of uh, water, uh, light, and things like that. Um, it's also going to spend most of its time breaking down you know, any dirt or, or anything like that in the environment. So you have to clean with a bleach solution. So if you, uh, if you read the bottle of bleach and it says, if you're using bleach for cleaning, clean, then use bleach. Um, so things like that. Iodine. Um, it's used a lot in the medical field they, uh, for a pre-surgical scrub and things like that just to de-germ the area to remove the, uh, the organisms that are there. Um, halogens, you can read what they're used for there, what they do. Um, phenolics, phenols. Um, carbolic acid is one of the very first types of these things discovered that was uh, used by Joseph Lister, a guy that um, Lister is named after him. He's the very first guy that um, started... Um, Sterilizing surgical tools using phenols, carbolic acid, um, and these things are going to break down the cell walls um, of bacteria and different other organisms. So, um, 
works pretty well on bacteria and funguses. Um, works okay on viruses. Um, it'll precipitate the viral proteins, but not uh, bacterial endospores and things like that. Um, Lysol um, is a very common type of phenolic. Triclosan um, is an antibiotic uh, or, uh, that was added a lot to soaps and cleaning and toothpaste and things like that. Um, it, it causes cancer. It's a very interesting um, but, uh, additive to particular choices. It's a type of phenol. Um, and they work by breaking apart the cell membranes and uh, participating or uh, precipitating um, the proteins that are found inside of it. So essentially it turns it into a cooked egg. Chlorohexidines. Um, it's blue. You've probably seen this at um, vets' offices um, and doctors' offices and things like this. Um, they use it to scrub down um, skin that's been damaged before they work on it. So um, if your skin's got a burn or a cut or something, they will usually uh, scrub it with that or spray it down. Um, with chlorohexidine to help um, break down the bacteria grow there. Um, low to intermediate level, if you use the it pure, it's intermediate. If you dilute it, it tends to be a little low um, and things like that. So different levels, different means, and different things that you're going to be using them for. Um, alcohols breaks down the um, cell lipids, the cell membranes. It's going to destroy those. It's also going to dehydrate the cells, desiccate the proteins, dry uh, coagulate them as well um, in pretty much every single cell it can get a hold of. Um, endospores not so much, but vegetative bacterial cells, things that are just happily growing, not producing endospores, fungus, things like that. Um, it's going to destroy them quite well. Um, it's an intermediate level. It doesn't work on everything, doesn't kill endospores, um, but it works really well by drying out the cells. Hydrogen peroxide. Um, hydrogen peroxide it comes in contact with um, um, your cells and it's going to be broken apart into free radicals. Now there are some bacteria that can survive this. If you're an aerobe, you can survive this. It makes sense. Hydrogen peroxide is um, going to be produced as a toxic byproduct of oxygen, um, breaking down the uh, oxygen for metabolism. Um, so you can break down that hydrogen peroxide. But anaerobes, they can't. They don't have the ability to break down hydrogen peroxide. They don't have those uh, chemicals and, and enzymes that break down toxic by oxygen byproducts. So the, those guys, if you expose hydrogen peroxide to them, they will die. It will outright kill them. Um, so bubbling on hydrogen peroxide indicates the hydrogen peroxide is being broken down. Um, no bubbling indicates that that organism is dying. Um, so it's opposite that, that uh, most people associate with it. Um, it works pretty well um, for an antiseptic at low concentrations on the skin, um, but if you up the concentration, it will burn your skin, but it will also kill endospores. Um, so it works really, really well, uh, but it's dangerous in high concentrations. Um, aldehydes, glutaraldehyde, formaldehyde, things like this, um, will work to um, destroy um, the protein and the DNA. It, it changes the, the shape of it. And when that happens, the bacteria or whatever the microorganisms are, um, are going to outright die as well. So formaldehyde and things like this are used um, to preserve tissues, um, things like that, or to sterilize something very quickly. Um, but they're also quite dangerous, formaldehyde, if you know anything about it. Um, it's, it's so toxic that we use it to preserve dead bodies, or we did for quite a long time, um, because it, it destroys everything. There's nothing that's going to grow on it for a really long time. Um, so it, it's a very high level, um, aldehydes are very high level, um, disinfectants. They work extremely well to kill, um, even endospores. So their, their use is slightly limited, um, since they are so toxic. Gases, there's lots of different types of gases that are used to kill things. Um, ethylene gas, propylene gas, um, it alkylates DNA, causes the DNA sh to change the shape of the bacteria's DNA to change. Um, when that happens, they die. Um, very, very, very high level disinfectant when you can screw up DNA. Um, and essentially you put it inside of a, um, a pressure chamber, you fill it full of that particular gas, and that gas is going to sit there um, and do its job. This is essentially kind of a tindalization process without the heat and steam, just a different gas that's added to it. Um, and you use this a lot for um, foods and things like that, prepackaged devices. Um, things like that that are going to be sitting around for a while um, and have lots of people touch them um, before they're consumed or used.
um, soaps, um, detergents, and things like that. Quats is a very commonly used um, um, thing. Quaternary ammonic compounds, quats, um, commonly used in soaps and other types of disinfectants and things like that. Um, and these guys are just going to alter the membrane permeability of uh, bacterial and fungal cells. Um, quats are found pretty much everywhere you guys look when you get something that's cleaning wise. Um, and it's going to cause the cell membrane to become more or less permeable than it normally is. Um, and when that happens, the cell is going to have some problems regulating stuff going in and out. Um, and it might cause the cell to die. It's a low level disinfectant, but it does work. Um, and then you have soaps, which are physically going to um, allow for the removal of the bacteria by uh, making the surface tension lower um, on this uh, thing that they're sitting on, which allows them to wash away easier. So that's the purpose of a soap. Heavy metals can sometimes be used to kill bacteria. Um, and heavy metals are cool. If you know anything about the saying, born with, born with a silver spoon in your mouth, this is where that comes from. Um, silver is naturally antibacterial. Um, it, bacteria doesn't grow on it um, well. So children a long time ago, spoons would either be made out of wood or you know, animal horn and things like that if you were poor, um, which would retain bacteria and mold and things like that. So children of poorer or, or, or uh, of less well-off parents um, would be fed with wooden spoons like that, and they would often get sick from those spoons. But if you were fed with a silver spoon, silver is naturally antiseptic, um, you, your babies were a little more healthy. So born with a silver spoon in your mouth, they would also, when the baby was born, put a silver spoon in that child's mouth for a little while to help clean the stuff inside the baby's mouth to help, uh, help the baby become a little more healthy. Um, they didn't really know exactly what was going on, they just knew it worked. Um, but nowadays we understand that most or lots of metals um, can actually kill or inhibit the growth of bacteria um, just naturally how they are, which is cool. Um, and it can mess up the DNA bonds, which is neat. Um, dyes can be used to inhibit the growth of bacteria. Crystal violets used in our McConkie auger to inhibit the growth of bacteria. Um, it was also used um, in, uh, as gentian purple. Um, you see it a lot in the, the veterinary fields on big animals and things like that. Um, so different types of dyes are used to kill bacteria, but they have a very narrow spectrum of use. Um, they don't kill lots of everything, you know, they don't kill everything. And, you know, you, nobody really wants to walk around with a big purple blob on their face. So they're, they're limited in what you can use them for. Um, acids, um, I've talked about acids before. Adding different acids to things lowers the pH. You can also add bases to things, um, which ups the pH. Um, and both of those have the exact same effect. If the organism doesn't like the change in pH, they're not going to be able to grow or they'll die. Um, and if the thing has a lot of acid in it, nothing that lands in it will be able to grow. So it's going to sit there forever um, and not spoil. So that's, that's a, a, another fantastic way that humans use to preserve things, adding acids um, or bases to them. So that's really all I've got for this particular PowerPoint over how humans control uh, the growth of microorganisms in and on things, um, particularly in food products um, and on and in uh, people and things that will be used for surgery. Um, so if you have any questions about this PowerPoint or you want me to elaborate on anything, please send me an email. Um, other than that, have a nice rest of your day.